for singing. Please be seated. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4 is where we'll be tonight. Philippians chapter 4. I trust everyone has had a wonderful and Merry Christmas. Yep. Um, my parents send their hello from Atlanta, Georgia. And for everyone who thinks that the 70 or 75 degrees is a little bit nippy down here, uh, I'm not sure you would survive the 38 or 35 degrees that I was in just a few days ago. Um, it was absolutely frigid, and I didn't think, uh, I frankly thought I was going to die. But uh, the Lord was merciful and allowed me to survive such disastrous and hazardous weather conditions, and um, here I am today. And um, I trust for those that I may not see through the week, I know I'll probably see a lot of you guys on Wednesday again, Thursday at Miami Beach, uh, but for those who um, I won't see, uh, have a happy new year, okay? I trust that the Lord was able to uh, bless your 2014, and I'm looking forward to what he's gonna do for my 2015. And I pray that it's a year that I continue to grow. And I just pray that it's a year that I get closer to, Lord, to the Lord. And I know my Savior a lot more to, uh, next year than I did this year. And at the end of next year, I can look back and just say, the Lord is good, just like I've done for the past 24 years of my life. And I, try, I know everyone here can probably say the exact same thing. So as we wind down 2014, let's not look back at some of the things we may have regret, but let's look back and say the Lord was truly truly good and we're looking forward to an exciting 2015 in which we pray pastor and i pray that the ministry will continue to grow and um and so forth and so on we're reading from philippians chapter 4 tonight philippians chapter 4 uh pastor asked me yesterday to preach uh tonight and since then i've been praying on a couple things that the lord would probably want me to speak on and tonight uh, I believe the Lord would want me to speak on a certain topic that I think could be very beneficial for all of us. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to go ahead and read, starting in verse number 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed to be both full and to be hungry, both abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. Father, I thank you for Paul and the ministry, the Lord, that we learned through your word, Lord, and how influential he was, the Lord, and how influential um, his letters still are. But Father, I pray as we looked at this um, particular part of Scripture that you will help us to, number one, focus on what you have for us, get all the cares and the worries of the world aside, put that all away and put that aside, and focus on you. Father God, may we be able to extract truth, dear Lord, not just truth that we can have knowledge, but truth that can be applicatory as well, that we can use as application and apply in our lives to be better Christians. Father, I pray, dear Lord, as I speak, that you will cleanse me of sin, you'll empty me of myself, and fill me with your spirit, dear Lord, so that way I can preach what thus saith the Lord. And at the end of the day, may you get all the honor and all the glory. Bless my family as their home, we ask in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4 is a very strong and a very good chapter. As we look at the beginning of Philippians chapter 4, we see a little bit of what I would call an appeal to rejoice in the Lord. Paul is talking about here in Philippians chapter 4, if you begin reading at verse 4, to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And if you were to continue reading, say, let your moderation be known unto men, or excuse me, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is a hand, be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. Finally, brethren, and then he goes through a list of things to, that we should think on, and it says that there should be any virtue, and if it, there be any praise, 
think on those things. And so Paul is just kind of giving us a little bit of a grocery list per se of things that you and I can apply in our lives and put in our lives to maintain, to maintain the joy of the Lord. By the way, might I say that a Christian should always be a joyous person. A Christian should always exude or exemplify joy. May not necessarily be happy because happiness is pretty much circumstantial. Happiness comes through whatever the, the, the situation is. But we can always experience the joy of the Lord. And we can always have the joy of the Lord. We kind of have this joke in our family, uh, one of my uncles, that you never ask him, how did your day go today? Because he's going to tell you everything that went wrong about the day. Even if he had the day off and he spent all day in bed, he would make that seem like the worst thing that you can ever endure in your entire life. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily just a characteristic of him or that's just how he was raised or whatever it is, but he's one of those people that you just don't really want to be around. And might I say, as a Christian, you should not be one of those people that you do not want to be around. In fact, your joy should be so infectious and contagious that people start being joyous because you're joyous, because you're happy. At the office all the time, I have people actually get annoyed, like, Taj, why are you smiling so much? You didn't sell anything last week. Yeah, but my God is still on the throne. And a lot of them, they don't even understand what that means, and they don't understand where that comes from. But you know what? It's just something that uh, we should always be joyous and we should always be happy and we should always be joy, joyful in the Lord because you know what? God is in control. And when God is in control and God is always in control and when God is on the throne, you and I have absolutely nothing to worry about. All of our cares, all of our worries, all of our fears, all of our trials, they're all second nature. They're all second hand when God is still on the throne. As long as we're in the center of God's will, is God's will. And as long as we are the children of God, God is always going to take care of us. And that in itself, should cause us to be joyous. And so that's something that we see in the beginning of, the, of uh, Philippians. But we look at our text now at Philippians chapter, or chapter 4, verse 10. Not only in the first part are we seeing a little bit of joy, but now Paul is kind of deviating into a word that you and I also need to be familiar with as we go about our Christian life. As we look at verse number 11, not that I speak, not that I speak in respect of want, and the word want there gives the idea of lack, or to, to uh, have less, or to... Uh, need per se, but not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be, what's that next word? Content. Therewith to be content. And now Paul is taking the next few verses and elaborating on the idea of being content. Christian, it may seem like a silly question, and it may seem like a question that shouldn't be asked, and it may seem like a question that we should all know the answer to, but truly, if you can look at your life and you can see what's going on maybe this past 24 hours, or the past 48 hours, or the past week, or the past month, or as I alluded to earlier, the past year, can you and I truly say that we are content? Can you and I truly say that, you know what, I am satisfied in what I have, no matter how great it is or how little it is? <laughs> you know, the unsaved, they really don't understand the word or don't understand the idea of content. You and I have a God to live for. You and I have Jesus Christ to live for. The only people that they have to live for, probably outside of their family, is who they think is the most important person. It's themselves. And in order to satisfy their needs, in order to satisfy their wants, or to satisfy their desires, they're always in the constant state of wanting more, 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 more. I can never have too much money. I can never have enough cars. I can never have too big of a house. I can never have too much property. I can never own too many things. They don't really have anything else that's going to satisfy until they continue to get more and more and more. And then they get into this greedy drive to continue to have more. But as Christians, more shouldn't necessarily be our drive. It should be a more of God and more of what God wants. And Paul elaborates on this quite beautifully. Are we actually, though, content? You know, unfortunately, I think there's a, a lot of people that are too busy complaining about their job instead of being grateful that they're not one of the thousands that are unemployed. 
I think there are maybe too many people that are complaining about their spouse or complaining about their children that they're actually not taking the time to be thankful of the fact that their spouse or their child or their children is healthy and not one of those that are with these, these diseases that can be terminal in some sense. I think a lot of people are just too busy complaining about their car, too busy complaining about their finances, that they don't take the time to thank God for the fact that the last bill was at least paid. Where do we find that balance? Where are we in that balance? Are we too busy complaining for so much more? Or are we thanking God for everything that he's done? How can we learn to be a little more content? I only have three quick points tonight. I don't plan on being up here long. But the first point, the first thing that we see is to rejoice, and rejoice in our substance. In order for us to be content, we have to rejoice in our substance. Go to 1 Timothy for me, please, real quick. Let's go to 1 Timothy. We're going to go to chapter 6, the last chapter of 1 Timothy. By the way, do you know what the Bible says about having contentment? Godliness with contentment? It's a great game. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. It exactly says that. But as we look down at the next verse, in verse 7, for we brought nothing in this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. If we can understand that sort of a verse, if we can understand that sort of a mindset, I think we'll have a little bit better of an understanding and, and, and grasping the idea of being content. When you were born into this world, ladies and gentlemen, you had absolutely nothing to your name. There was nothing that you owned. There was nothing that you possessed. You didn't walk into this world saying, that's mine and I own it. And when you expire or when you pass away or when you die, you're going to take absolutely nothing out. Now, in that in-between time, everything that you gain, you have to obtain it. Or it has to be, excuse me, it has to be given to you in order for you to have some sort of possession of it. You may have physical possession of it, but it was given to you by somebody. It was given to you by the Lord. You know, you don't own your children, parents. In fact, the Lord has just given you the time uh, uh, to raise them and to mold them into, into godly individuals. He's given you stewardship of your children. You don't own your possessions, but the Lord has allowed you to have your possessions so that way maybe you can use it for his glory. You don't own your house though your name may be on the mortgage. You don't own your car, though you may be the insured on the policy. You don't own anything in this world. If we did have true ownership, we'd be able to take it, and we can't. But everything that we have is given of the Lord. And if we have that mindset, if we have that idea that everything that we have, God has allowed us to have, how dare we ask him for more? How dare we be greedy and desire more money, more possessions, more this and that. Now, I'm not saying that we can't have more in the essence of, you know, more spiritual growth or, or, or more godliness or things like that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm talking about when we're focused on greed, when we're focused on, on, on developing more substance, that's where we run into the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have to rejoice in what we have because it's what God has given us. And you and I have to be thankful in what we have because it's what God has given us. You may say, I have a need. You may say, I'm lacking in something. I actually need something. The Bible says that God's going to supply all of our needs. God's not going to leave you out to dry. God's not going to leave you out to hang. God's not going to leave you abandoned. He's not going to leave you begging. He's going to supply your needs is going to take care of the things that you may, you may need in order to go on through your daily survivals or, or go on to have your necessities taken care of. But can you and I continually say that we're content? Lord, whatever I have, whatever's in my possession, whatever's in my house, whatever's in my hands, I thank you for it because it's yours. Go back with me to Philippians. We'll go back to Philippians chapter 4. And I want you to see what Paul is saying right after he says, whatsoever sin I'm in there with to be content. 
Philippians chapter 4, I've got to get there. Philippians chapter 4, we look at verse 12. I know both how to be a base. The word of base, it gives the connotation of little or, or, or less. I know how to be a base, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, both, both to abound and to suffer need. We're looking at two different extremities there. Okay, He's saying, I know how to be a base. I know how to be little. I know not to have much. I know, I know when there's not a lot under my name. I know when I don't have much. By the way, where was Paul when he was writing Philippians? He was in prison. Sitting there in a jail cell. And he's writing these things about learning how to be a base. Learning how to abound. Learning how to suffer need. Learning how to be hungry. Learning how to be full. He knows how to do all these things. How, why, why does he keep saying that? Why does he know? Because he knows what his substance is, and he is satisfied and content with what his substance is. And Christian, you and I walk a dangerous line, and we, and we, and we uh, push a dangerous button when we look at God, at our possessions, and say, you know what, Lord, you could give me a little more. Maybe we're in a position where everything that we have is too much, and we say, Lord, you can give me a little less. When can we stop complaining and start rejoicing in what we have? Now, church, I don't know necessarily what you may be going through. I don't know what you may not be content with. The fact of the matter is, I may be talking to a building full today of people that are absolutely content. Maybe I'm the only one that needs to really settle this and, and, and address this for myself, but the truth of the matter is, if we step back and take a look, there's always something that's nagging that we're always complaining about. Do we learn, have we learned, how to base, how to, how to be a base and how to be, uh, to be a found? Not only should we rejoice in our substance, secondly, we see we should rest in our situation. Once again, Paul is not necessarily in a tropical paradise penning these words with a nice glass of lemonade on a hammock. <laughs> saying, yeah, I learned how to be a base and I learned how to bound. Whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. I have seen him probably in this dark dungeon-like, probably ball chain, and he's writing, you know what? Whatsoever state I'm in, I will be content. Resting in your situation. How do you rest in your situation? Resting in your situation isn't necessarily just settling. Let's say that again. Resting in your situation is not necessarily just settling. In other words, it's not just saying, well, there's nothing I can really do about it. Whatever. That's it. Or, I, I can't really take that next step, or maybe, yeah, I could push a little more, but I need to learn how to be content of this and that. And in fact, the Bible doesn't, doesn't even tell us to settle. It tells us to push on. We're always supposed to be active. We're always supposed to be going forward. But that's not what we're talking about. We're saying rest in your situation. In fact, what we're saying is having a sense of, instead of settling, surrendering. Letting the Lord take care of the situation. Letting the Lord take care of you. Letting the Lord take care of your finances, your possessions, your family, your health, whatever it may be. Saying, God, I can't do this, but I can do it with you. When you tell me to move and when you tell me to take that next step, I will. And I'll give it everything that I have. But if you tell me to sit back and to wait, I'll do that with everything I have. This is how we learn to surrender. When we recognize we can't do this, when we recognize in our own strength, it's impossible, it can't be done. But with God, we let it go, we let it all to Him. We surrender, it's amazing how we can have that peace that passes all understanding. When you have that peace, it's very, very easy to rest in the situation that you're in. 
Paul was sitting there in jail, and you know what? He absolutely knew that he was in the center of God's will. He knew he was where he was supposed to be when it comes to his relationship with the Lord. And might I ask that maybe you and I aren't really content, or maybe you and I are really struggling or complaining a lot because we're just not necessarily in the center of God's will. It's because we're not in the center of God's will. We don't desire what he desires. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all ties in together. We have to be able to rest in our situation. We may have the biggest bank account in the church. We may have three cents to our name. But you know what? There's still a God that's on the throne. And as long as he's on the throne, as long as he's in control, as long as he's there, he will always take care of you. Not sometimes, not most of the times. You're not going to be abandoned. You may not get the answer you want. You may not win the million dollar lottery. Don't do it, by the way. You may not do such things. You may not, you, you may not accumulate so much wealth and you may not be monetarily outstanding. But you know what? Isn't it invaluable when we have God on our side to take care of us anyway? It's absolutely worth it. Worth more than anything that we can put a price on. Worth more than any amount of money that we can have in a bank account. Worth more than the newest Maserati or BMW or anything like that. Being able to rest in your situation, knowing that you don't have a lot, but knowing that God's in control can help us understand how we can be content. Now, lastly, and again, I, like I said, I didn't plan on taking long tonight. There's no need to uh, belabor something that the Lord puts plainly. But lastly, I want us to see that we need to realize our own strength. Not only should we rejoice in our substance, not only should we rest in our situation, but we should realize our own strength. You know, uh, when, when we look at verses in the Bible, there, there are certain verses that we key in and we hone on that's fantastic. For example, I think one of the more memorized verses in the Bible is John 3.16. We all could quote it. For God so loved the world that he, the, excuse me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish by everlasting life. It's a verse that we grew up with from our young age to, to, to today. But a lot of us miss the beauty of the message that's in John 3, all in its entirety with Nicodemus. A lot of us miss the, the truth that can be taken out. We focus on verse 16, but there's 15 previous verses that talks about God's mercy. Or shows God's mercy, mercy, I should say. And I think we see the same thing here when we look at a very common verse as well. In Philippians chapter 4, remember the context. Remember Paul here is in jail. Remember, Paul is talking about ways that we can uh, exemplify joy or rejoice in the Lord. Now he's kind of deriving, and in fact, when we hit verse, thir th excuse me, verse 13, we're kind of hitting another thought, but it correlates with the previous verses that we have. For I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. By the way, he didn't say, I can't. He didn't have a language of pessimism. When you say you can't do something, you actually restrict the hands of God. You actually say there's no way that the Lord can give me the power to do it. He also didn't say I can do all things through, or I can do all things. He didn't make it presumptuous. He didn't make it all about him. He didn't say that this is my life and I run it how I want to. And you know what? I'm going to take whatever I can, and I'm going to do whatever I can to continue to make myself uh, be uh, content with what I do. He didn't say anything of that. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. There's a correlation. It requires two. It requires us, and it requires him. The minute we try to take one of us out of the picture, it becomes an impossibility. We have to recognize our own strength, ladies and gentlemen, that no, maybe in your own self, you can't do it. But you know what? With the strength of the Lord, you can. Maybe it's a certain sin that you haven't uh, um, overcome. Maybe it's 
uh, some sort of financial situation that you just can't get yourself out of. But you know what? Whenever you turn to the Lord and say, God, I trust you, I rely on you, that's the surrendering we were just talking about, saying, I can't do this by myself. I need you more than anything. That's when we rely on the strength of the Lord to get us through. I was telling the teenagers uh, this morning for Sunday school, we're kind of going through uh, prayer. We're talking about answered prayer. And I said one of the reasons that we ask somebody, we ask somebody for help is because they may be, in a, or they may be experienced in a certain situation that I'm not. I may ask a pastor for help because I buy a boat and it's not running. Or I may ask Pastor for help because he's good with cars and I'm not necessarily the best. I may ask Chris or Alex about a health issue. I may ask Charlie, what does quesadilla mean? I don't know, something Spanish. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's when we ask other people for help is because we're not necessarily the experts in that ourselves. You know, it's really, like I told you, it's not natural for us to be content. Look, look at the language of what Paul is saying. He says, I know. He says, I know how to abound. He said, I am instructed. I have learned. These are things Paul had to learn himself as well. It's not natural for you and I to say, well, that's the situation I am. Praise the Lord. You and I can always want more. and It can always be better. It can always be an easier situation. But he's learned through his ministry. The whatsoever state he's in, there were to be content. And how did he learn that? He learned that through the strength. The strength of the Lord. I wrap up this by talking about one of the most, in fact, the richest man on earth. There was an interview done with Bill Gates a couple of years ago. I don't know how much Bill Gates' net worth is, but I do know how much Warren Buffett's net worth is, $63 billion with a B, $63 billion. And he's the third richest man in the world, so Bill Gates has so much more than that. And Bill Gates has it all. Bill Gates has the nice house. Google it sometime. It's kind of crowded, but it's nice. He has the cars, he has the three swimming pools, he, he has one of the most successful operating systems known to man. He, he knows pretty much anything about computers, the man is an intelligent himself. And as he sat there and he, and he was conducting, or he was uh, being interviewed by one of the news reporters, they asked him, you know what Bill, you have everything man. Your net worth is near the hundreds of billions. You and I all together with all of our lifetime savings in this building probably won't even accumulate a billion. Yet he has 80, 90 billion dollars he can claim to his name. And they ask him, you know, oh, you, you, you have so much. What else would you desire? And his answer, the richest man in the world was, I wish I had another billion dollars just to be on the safe side. And here's me. If I have 20 bucks, I think I'm pre doing pretty good myself. The richest man in the world naturally wants to have more. And if he has everything, what makes you think that it's natural for us to not desire more? But it's something that has to be learned. Contentment. Contentment is something that has to be learned. And we can only do it through the strength of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever you have, whatever your substance is, rejoice in it. Whatever the situation may be, maybe you don't have much. Maybe you don't have the nice house, or maybe you don't even have a fully operative car. Rejoice in that. Rest in the situation that the Lord has put you in. And then realize your strength that you can do all things through Christ. With the idea of being content. With the idea of, uh, of, of having, or God giving you what you need, having what you need. Maybe I'll refrain from that. Excuse me. But at the end of the day, I know from my own personal life, 
this was very important to me because of the job that I have. They're very money driven. And it's an excellent opportunity to establish yourself financially in that, in that, in that situation. Uh, my manager will always tell me that there's no such thing as a check if it doesn't have a comma in it. And you know, if you're not careful, you can have that sort of a mindset. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with being financially st stable or anything like that, but there is sin and greed. And the Lord has used this to help me keep myself in check. Because again, it's not natural for me to learn contentment. Or it's not natural for me to, to have contentment. I have to learn it. If I'm honest with you, church, which I always will be, it's been a struggle. But God is teaching me how to be a base. God is teaching me how to abound. God is teaching me how to be content when I need to suffer need or when I'm hungry, when I'm full, or when I have or when I don't. I think of the time when I first moved out here. I'm asking Devin to pay for meals to get some Wendy's because I didn't have anything. And then I think of times where maybe I can do. What do we do with that? Maybe a lot of us here are financially secure. What do we do with that? How much does that go towards ministry? How much of that goes towards God? How much does that go towards uh, securing ourselves financially? Or does it all just go in that BMW? Or that new tablet? Or that investment? Whatever it may be. We understand where the category of being financially smart and being greedy lie. Where do we fall in that? Where, we, where do we fall in the idea of contentment? Is it a struggle or is it something that we're willing to learn? As we go into 2015, which is a mere four days away, may we, may we be able to say, in whatsoever state I'm in, there to be content. And I trust we'll see the blessings of the Lord along the way. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, and thank you so much for everything that you've done in our lives. Thank you for Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, and thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, it's a life-changing book. It's a Christ-honoring book. And Father, I pray that we don't allow this to just sit on our, on our shelves, but may we continue to dwell in it daily continue to desire to just learn more and more and continue to desire to grow more in you Father God I pray for Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church every day I pray that you won't allow me to stop help me to continue to do so Father I pray for us as a church and this idea of being content, dear Lord. Dear Lord, may we desire more of you more than we desire more of possessions. May we desire more of your holiness than we desire more money. May we desire more of your glory than we do more fame or more notoriety. And Father God, may we give you more praise in the process. In order for this to happen, dear Lord, it starts with me. Dear Lord, I'm not much, but dear Lord, you spoke to me. And I pray that this becomes more applicable in my life than it's been before. Father God, I don't know the individual circumstances here in the church. Maybe there aren't any, but if there are, I just pray that you'll speak to the hearts of those. Dear Lord, who's struggling with the idea of being content being thankful, being satisfied with what you've given them. And may we learn that so that we, we continue to exhibit joy and continue to have that door of opportunity and that window of opportunity to continue to grow in you. Father, we'll be sure to give you all the honor and all the glory along the way. We ask this, and we pray for all the church members who are out traveling. Grant them safety, we ask in your name. Amen.
Thank you. You're dismissed.